This is Winchester Academy. That is correct. Happy to introduce Dr. Bruce Hetzler. Well, thank you very much for that delightful introduction. I hope you all weren't disappointed that we didn't have any free beer tonight when you came in. I am a professor at Lawrence in Appleton, and I suppose it is appropriate that someone from Appleton talk about alcohol because six months ago, Appleton was noted as the drunkest city in Wisconsin. And then on May 17th this year, Appleton was noted as the drunkest city in the United States. So, tomorrow the world. So, if I'm going to talk about alcohol and the brain, I thought I'd begin by talking a bit about the brain. There's the brain. Looks more like something you might find wash up on a seashore than one of the wonders of the world, but that's it. Uh, it's got about, oh, a hundred billion neurons in it, give or take a few. And I tell my students I never expect them to learn any more than half of them by name. <laughs> so we can, for the purposes of this lecture, just talk a bit about some of the divisions of the cerebral cortex, that's the outer surface. Cortex means bark. You know how you can tell a dogwood tree? No. By its bark. <laughs> Sorry about that, but I have a reputation to live down to. So we could talk about the various lobes of the brain. So at the front of the brain, we have the frontal lobe. That's involved in the control of movement. Then here we have the parietal lobe, and that is involved in somatosensory sensations, touch, pressure, cold, warmth, pain. At the back of the brain is the occipital lobe. That's where you see something. You don't actually register a conscious visual sensation 
until the information gets from your eyes out here all the way back here to the occipital lobe. When it arrives in the occipital lobe, that's when you see something. On the side of the brain is the temporal lobe. That's involved in hearing. You hear things and understand them when the information reaches the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe also has some structures involved in memory. In particular, on the inside of the, of the temporal lobe is a structure called the hippocampus. And that's involved in the formation of conscious memories. In fact, what did the hippocampus say in his retirement speech? <laughs> Thanks for the memories. <laughs> I'll keep throwing them out. You can laugh at the ones you like. If we look down on top of the brain, we can see we can divide it into a left half and a right half. The left half involves the control of language. You talk because of circuits in the left hemisphere of your brain, and you also understand speech because of what's going on in the left hemisphere of your brain. Uh, things like spatial concepts, uh, the ability to read a map, or navigate yourself around, or put a puzzle together. Those things are controlled by the right hemisphere. Now, there's a contralateral control of the brain. And that means that everything from the right side of the world is sent to the left hemisphere of the brain. And that's shown here. Again, you're looking down on top of the brain. Here you have the left eye and the right eye. And out here is the visual field. This would be the center of your visual field. Everything to the right of it would be your right visual field. Everything to the left would be your left visual field. So actually, if you are staring at the screen right now, and this is sort of the middle, everything over here would be your right visual field, and everything over there would be your left visual field. The point of this is that everything in the left visual field is sent to the right hemisphere of your brain. And everything in the right visual field is sent to the left hemisphere of your brain. This is also true for touch sensations. For example, if you shake hands with someone with your right hand, you feel their hand in your left hemisphere, in your left parietal lobe. Is that clear? Okay. Now, here you are looking at the left hemisphere of the brain, and this is where the language centers are located. There is part up here in the frontal lobe called Broca's area, and that controls the production of speech. You talk because of circuits in Broca's area. There is another part of the left hemisphere, Wernicke's area. That's located back in here. That's the angular gyrus. Uh, this is Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area controls the understanding of speech. You can understand what I am saying because of circuits in Wernicke's area. If Wernicke's area were damaged, you could still talk but you couldn't understand what you are saying, and probably no one else could either. Your speech would be fluent, but meaningless. Sort of like a politician. <laughs> okay. This is a mid-sagittal cut through the brain that is cut right down the middle, and this is the medial part of the cerebral cortex, but this is what I wanted to talk about, the brain stem, sort of the bottom of the brain that's right above the spinal cord. The spinal cord would continue down like that. This is the brain stem. The lowest portion of the brain stem, right here, is called the medulla. That's involved in 
basic uh, reflexes of the body. You have breathing centers here in the medulla. Your heart rate is controlled there, and your breathing and your blood pressure. The main cause of death from a drug overdose, tonight we're talking about alcohol, but this would be true for opiates as well. For most drugs, the main cause of death is cessation of breathing. And that's because of the effects the drugs have on the breathing centers here in the medulla. That is, the person stops breathing. And that's what happens often with fatalities from alcohol. There are other reasons we'll talk about later, but the main reason is cessation of breathing. So this is the brainstem. Now, back here, sort of stuck to the back of the brainstem, like a little head of cauliflower, is the cerebellum. And that's involved in the control of rapid movements. It controls hand-eye coordination. So if you are playing tennis, for example, you have to coordinate the visual input of the tennis ball with the swing of the arm with the racket so that you hit the ball appropriately. And those timing circuits are controlled by the cerebellum. Now, obviously, those timing circuits are very important when you're driving a car. And too much alcohol will make you a very poor driver. That's because alcohol depresses these timing circuits in the cerebellum. You cannot control the car accurately under the influence of alcohol. We'll say a bit more about that later. Okay so far? Okay. Now, this again is a mid-sagittal section running up through the core of the brain stem is a very complicated network of neurons called the reticular formation. The main function of the reticular formation is to keep the brain awake. When you are awake, the reticular formation is active. When you are asleep, the reticular formation is turned off. Sleep is an active phenomenon. You have separate circuits, mainly in the brainstem, that control the different phases of sleep. We'll say a little more about sleep later on when we talk about the effects of alcohol on sleep. But for right now, again, your ability to stay awake depends upon the activity of the reticular formation. And you fall asleep when the reticular formation is turned off. That's an individual neuron. That's a microelectrode. That's recording activity from an individual neuron. And those are real neurons. This is a schematic diagram of a neuron showing its various components. So you have a cell body that contains the nucleus of the cell, as well as all the metabolic machinery that keeps the neuron alive. There are a number of extensions from the cell body called dendrites. The function of the dendrites is to collect information from other neurons. There's also a single long process called an axon. And the function of the axon is to send information to other neurons or to muscles or glands. Now the axon has a fatty coating around it that's called myelin. You could sort of think of an axon as a 10 foot long hot dog and these myelin segments as hot dog buns lined up along the axon. The function of the myelin is to speed up the rate at which a message is sent from 
the cell body down to the axon endings. If the myelin is damaged, then the information goes very slowly. That's what happens in diseases like multiple sclerosis. That's a disease in which your body attacks the myelin along the axons, slowing the rate of conduction. This is an artist's representation of a synapse. Now a synapse is the area in which one neuron sends information to another neuron. This is the end of an axon. So that would be one of these little beads down here. And then there's a gap called a synaptic cleft. And then there's the dendrite or cell body that makes up the other portion of the synapse. So information is transmitted in one direction from the axon ending to the dendrite or cell body. Now you will notice these little spheres in the axon ending. Those are called synaptic vesicles. They contain neurotransmitter substance, a chemical that is released. You can see the release here from a synaptic vesicle. The chemical is released. It crosses the synaptic cleft. It interacts with receptors that are embedded in the postsynaptic membrane. So there is, again, a presynaptic portion. That's the axon ending. That contains the synaptic vesicles. There is the postsynaptic membrane. That's the other neuron that receives the information. And then the synaptic cleft is the space in between. Is that all clear? <laughs> Good, because there will be a test at the end. OK. Here you have a neuron, and here you have axons from other neurons, and you have synaptic endings here. A single neuron can have up to about 50,000 synapses on it. And each of these axons releases a different neurotransmitter substance. We will talk about some of these substances a little later on. OK? So you're probably thinking it's about time you got to alcohol. <laughs> so an alcohol is something that has an hydroxyl group on it, an OH. There are many different types of alcohols. Methyl alcohol has one carbon atom. Ethyl alcohol has two. When people talk about alcohol, this is what they are referring to, ethyl alcohol or ethanol. That's the compound in alcoholic beverages. Isopropyl alcohol, that's rubbing alcohol. You don't want to drink that. <laughs> Actually, you don't want to drink methyl alcohol either. That can cause blindness. During prohibition, a lot of the bootleg alcohol had a lot of methyl alcohol in it, causing a lot of problems. So when you drink alcohol, it's absorbed from the entire gastrointestinal tract. It diffuses throughout the entire body, but it's not stored anywhere. So you can't drink a quart of vodka on Friday night and expect it to last the whole weekend doesn't work like that. Again, if you're drinking alcohol, about 10% is absorbed from the stomach, 90% from the small intestine. Since it's evenly distributed in all bodily fluids, that means a larger person will have a lower 
blood alcohol concentration than a lighter person because the larger person will have more bodily fluid. So the alcohol will be distributed in a larger fluid volume. That's one reason why if a man and a woman drink the same amount of alcohol, the woman will have a higher blood alcohol content because typically women are smaller than men. But that's just one reason. There are three. A second reason has to do with fat. As the amount of fat in a person's body increases, if weight is the same, there's a decrease in body fluid because fat has very little blood supply. There's really not much fluid in the fat content. That is a second reason that if a man and a woman, let's say they're the same weight, drink the same amount of alcohol, the woman will have a higher blood alcohol concentration because a woman has more fat than the man. Therefore, a smaller blood supply and therefore a higher blood alcohol concentration. Is that clear? Here you have the metabolism of alcohol. This will be on the test. <laughs> so alcohol is first metabolized by an enzyme, alcohol dehydrogenase. And that converts alcohol into acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is then converted by acetaldehyde dehydrogenase into acetic acid. And acetic acid is ultimately broken down into carbon dioxide, water, and energy. So that's the basic metabolism of alcohol. Now, about 95% of alcohol is metabolized in the liver. The remaining 5% is excreted by the lungs. And that's how you can do a breathalyzer test on alcohol content. And you can determine a person's blood alcohol concentration by how much alcohol is in their breath. Now, I know I'm not talking about marijuana now, but you can't do that for marijuana. Uh, marijuana has got about 400 different compounds in it. And right now, there's not a very good test to determine uh, how high a person is via a blood test or breathalyzer test, but you can with alcohol. Now, with alcohol, unlike most drugs, uh, for most drugs, so-called first pass metabolism is in the liver. That is, contents of the small intestine go straight to the liver where the drug is metabolized and whatever is not metabolized makes it into the bloodstream. So that's true for most drugs. That's not true for alcohol. Alcohol's first pass metabolism is in the stomach. You have gastric alcohol dehydrogenase. So some of the alcohol gets metabolized in the stomach before it makes it to the small intestine, before it makes it to the liver. And this is the third reason that women will have a higher blood alcohol concentration than men. In men, gastric alcohol dehydrogenase, that is alcohol dehydrogenase in the stomach, is more active in men than it is in women. So it will metabolize more alcohol in men than in women. Meaning, in men, less alcohol will make it to the bloodstream than in women. So that's the third reason if a man and a woman drink the same amount of alcohol, a woman will have a higher blood alcohol concentration. I know you're supposed to save your questions, so I won't say, are there any questions? <laughs> Just remember your, your questions till later. 
Assuming you haven't been drinking, because that might interfere with your ability <laughs> to remember. Okay. Here we go. That, once again, is the uh, metabolic pathway. Now, we'll talk a bit about the psychopharmacology of alcohol. At low doses, alcohol can make you feel less anxious, more relaxed. We'll talk about why that is later on. But alcohol also tends to inhibit your inhibitions meaning that in a social context, you may be more gregarious, or friendly, or inappropriate. <laughs> it tends to inhibit uh, what's going on in your prefrontal cortex. I didn't really talk about that when I talked about the lobes of the brain. But while the frontal lobe is involved in the control of movement, the front of the frontal lobe, the so-called prefrontal cortex, involves your uh, judgment. And the circuits in there are inhibited by alcohol. So you lose your inhibitions because of the effects of alcohol on your prefrontal cortex. And that tends to make you do things that you wouldn't do if you were not drunk, like engage in risky behavior. They could be driving rapidly, or there could be risky sexual behavior as well. We'll talk a bit about tolerance. Tolerance means you get less of an effect from the same dose of a drug. There is acute tolerance, and that occurs within a single exposure, that is a single drink. And this acute tolerance is called tachyphylaxis. And basically, if you plot blood alcohol concentration, it's an inverted U shape. That is, alcohol, blood alcohol concentration increases to a peak and then decreases. But at some point on the way up and on the way down, you're going to have exactly the same blood alcohol level. That effect will be more pronounced on the way up on the rising phase than on the falling phase. And that's what we call the acute tolerance. You'll be a much poorer driver on the way up than on the way down, even though the blood alcohol concentration will be identical. This shows the effects of blood alcohol concentration on behavior. As you've probably noticed from observing your spouse, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the more they drink, the further down on the scale they go. With a blood alcohol concentration of 0.02 to 0.03, there are minimal effects, although if you happen to be a teenager, any alcohol will interfere with your driving. Uh, for a normal adult, you really lose a lot of motor control from a blood alcohol concentration of 0.08 and up. And by the time you get to about 0 0.30, you're stuporous. Blood alcohol concentration of 0.45, you might be in a coma. And that's a lethal dose for about half of the population. It's what we call LD50, LD standing for lethal dose. So what do you have to drink to get a DUI or OWI? In Wisconsin, again, if you're, it depends on your age. If you're under 21, 0.02%. I mentioned that just about any alcohol 
will make you a poor driver if you're a teenager. If you're 21 or older, and I think most of you are, it's 0.08. If you drive a bus or something, 0.04. Students at Lawrence want to know about alcohol and sex. So uh, it's interesting that both men and women think that if a member of the opposite sex has been drinking, that that person is more interested in sex and are more available. And both men and women are more likely to have sex on a date if they've been drinking. This is often attributed to what's called the alcohol myopia theory. That is, you're more likely to attend to what's right in front of you as if you're looking through a microscope. It's like, you're hot, you're here, why not? <laughs> and remember, alcohol is limited to your inhibitions, so as, uh, let's see, I think the song, you know, live for today and don't worry about tomorrow. Alcohol and body temperature. This is interesting. A lot of people assume that if you drink a little alcohol, you'll feel warm and fuzzy. It'll make you warm on a cold winter's night. Well, yes and no. Alcohol does tend to increase blood circulation to the skin, so you do have sort of a warm, flushing sensation. However, what alcohol really does is make you poikilothermic, that is lizard-like. Your body temperature raises and lowers with the ambient temperature. So, if you drink on a cold Wisconsin night, and then go outside in the snow, you may freeze to death. On the other hand, if you drink and then go outside on a hot summer night, you might have seizures and die. I have a friend who is a, an emergency physician for the Indianapolis 500. And down there by the racetrack, it's very, very hot. And he constantly treats people that have had too much beer and have seizures. Because remember, you get poikilothermic in a hot environment, your body temperature raises. And that can cause a seizure. So what about alcohol and memory? Alcohol has a number of different effects on memory. One is called Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, and there's alcoholic blackout, and finally, state-dependent memory. That doesn't mean your memory is dependent on your living in the state of Wisconsin, <laughs> but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome is in many ways the most serious uh, memory effect of alcohol. It occurs after years of alcohol consumption. And you have some disorientation, of poor coordination, ataxia, that is you tend to stumble and fall. But the main concern, the concern now as far as memory goes, is you have a permanent anterograde amnesia. There are two types of amnesia. There's a retrograde amnesia and an anterograde amnesia. In a retrograde amnesia, you can't remember things from the past. In an anterograde amnesia, you can't remember things in the future. That is, you cannot form new memories. It's like you're constantly living in a, uh, as if you're just waking up from a dream. And you're just coming into consciousness. You have no idea what happened five minutes ago or 10 minutes ago. If you were to meet someone, well, if you had developed this, and this typically happens after, say, 10 to 20 years of serious drinking, 
And once you develop this, if you were to meet someone, you could talk with them, have a nice conversation, remember their name while you're talking to them. But if they leave the room and come back 10 minutes later, you'll have no memory of ever having met them before. I don't know if any of you ever saw the movie Memento. That had nothing to do with alcohol, but it was about someone that had the severe anterograde amnesia. Now, this uh, Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome results from damage to two portions of the brain. I didn't talk about these. Um, the medial thalamus and the mammillary bodies of the hypothalamus. They're both in an inner portion of the brain called the diencephalon, and they're both damaged by alcohol. Once the damage occurs, it is impossible to reverse. You can prevent further damage with thiamine, that is vitamin B1. So vitamin B1 can stop further damage, but it can't reverse what's already happened. So once Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome sets in, that's it as far as your ability to form new memories. Now there is another part of it that is reversible. People in the early stages of Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome have what's called confabulation. That is they can't remember things, so they just make it up. Now, they are not lying. They believe at the time that what they're saying is true, but it's all made up. And this confabulation occurs because of the effects of alcohol on the prefrontal lobe. And the confabulation part of Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome does clear up after a couple of months but they never regain the ability to form new conscious memories. Now, I'll digress just a minute. There are a number of different types of memories, and for right now we can subdivide them, subdivide them into conscious and unconscious. For example, your knowledge that you know how to ride a bicycle is a conscious memory. But your ability to ride the bicycle is an unconscious memory. So someone with Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome could, for example, learn how to ride a bicycle. But they would have no memory of having learned it. So as far as they, were, as far as they would know, they could not ride a bicycle. If you asked them if they could ride it, they would say no because that would have been true before they developed the Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome. So they would have no memory of having learned it, even though they could learn it. Is that distinction clear? Okay. Then there's the alcoholic blackout. That's where, once you are sober, you don't remember what happened while you were under the influence of alcohol. Now, one problem with this is that it's based on retrospective accounts when you're sober. And it's often difficult to distinguish between uh, a real forgetfulness versus not wanting to remember what you did. <laughs> I did what your mother? No. Or, or whatever. And finally, there is state-dependent memory. This is what's called a dissociative effect of alcohol. That is, a person under the influence of alcohol can do something but have no memory of it when they are sober. If they get drunk again, they will remember. Alcoholics, for example, will hide alcohol and money. They can't find either when they're sober, but when they're drunk, they'll get the money and find the bottle of alcohol.
I mentioned earlier, sleep. Some people think that if you have a nightcap, that'll help you sleep better. Sorry, that's not the case. Alcohol produces poor sleep. It disrupts normal sleep. There is a reduction of what's called REM sleep. You probably know that means rapid eye movement. You have a number of stages of sleep, and I'll show you a slide of that in just a minute. One stage is called REM sleep, and that's the stage during which you have your normal dreams. And that's reduced under the influence of alcohol. So you dream much less under the influence of alcohol. You also have what's called sleep fragmentation. That is, you tend to awaken more frequently during the night. And alcohol will also either exacerbate or produce sleep apnea. In sleep apnea, you cannot breathe and sleep at the same time. So people with sleep apnea fall asleep and then stop breathing. Gradually, there's a buildup of carbon dioxide in the blood. They wake up gasping for breath. They then fall asleep again and stop breathing again. This can happen a hundred times a night or more. And if you have sleep apnea, alcohol will make it worse. If you don't have it, alcohol can produce it. Most people have a little tiny bit of sleep apnea. It may happen once or twice a night. But someone with severe sleep apnea may have it 100 or 200 times or more a night. And alcohol will make it much worse. Now, if you've been drinking a lot and then stop drinking, you have a rebound effect on sleep. So whereas REM sleep was suppressed when you were drinking, you have what's called a REM rebound. You have much more REM sleep than normal when you stop drinking. Now this is a normal night's sleep, and it shows the various stages of sleep. Here you're awake, that's what the W stands for, wakefulness. Then you go through stage one, two, three, and four. Then you quickly come back up to one. But any stage one after the first one is called REM sleep. And that's where you have the rapid eye movements, and that's where dreaming occurs. And you typically go through about four or five of these cycles every night. And with each successive cycle, REM sleep gets longer. You typically awaken during the last REM sleep of the night, which could last an hour or more. And that's the dream you typically remember in the morning. You'll also notice that these deeper stages, stages three and four, drop out over the course of the night. So you start out with a long stage four, and that's where snoring occurs. Also, um, the night terrors of children. Children will oftentimes sit up in their bed and just start screaming, staring out into space. That's occurring during the stage four. They are asleep. They will gradually go back to stage three, two, and one and lay down and stop screaming. And children typically outgrow this. Although it is related to an adult phenomenon called incubus. And this sometimes happens in adults uh, where this feeling of being locked in a tomb or having uh, rocks on your chest. That's probably how the term nightmare got started. Uh, nightmare meaning pressing devil. What about a hangover? Hopefully you aren't suffering from that now, and hopefully you won't tomorrow. Uh, symptoms you might be familiar with, fatigue, headache, 
increased sensitivity to light, tachycardia, that is a rapid heartbeat, dizziness, depression. It begins when the blood alcohol level is falling and it reaches its peak when the blood alcohol level is zero. Now, I don't recommend it, but obviously the way then to get rid of that is to drink a little more. But don't do that. Predictors of a hangover are the blood alcohol concentration. The higher the concentration, the more likely you are to have it. So-called congeners. These are byproducts, a main one being methanol. But uh, dark colored drinks like whiskey, bourbon, and red wine have the highest percentage of congeners. So they're more likely to produce a hangover than a white wine or a light beer, for example, or gin or vodka. There are a number of things that are sold as cures for hangovers, but none of them have been tested. Really, the main thing is just time. You just have to sleep it off. You take an aspirin for the headache, not Tylenol, not anything with acetaminophen in it. The main cause of liver damage in the United States is acetaminophen, that is the compound in Tylenol. And that's especially true if you take Tylenol with alcohol. So never take Tylenol or any other cold remedy that's got acetaminophen in it if you're having alcohol, because they will combine to damage the liver. So be very weary or leery of uh, acetaminophen with alcohol. So the best way to avoid a hangover is to drink in moderation. If alcohol is consumed very rapidly, you can drink a lethal amount even before you pass out because the alcohol will continue to be absorbed from your stomach and intestines after you're done drinking. So just because a person is not unconscious on the floor doesn't mean that they can drive or they're not going to die or something from it. Because they can still drink enough before passing out that it can kill them. As I mentioned, the death results from cessation of breathing of centers in the medulla. Now, these are some of the neurotransmitters in the brain. There are a lot of them. We don't have the time to talk about all of them. But glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. It's a main neurotransmitter that excites other neurons. And alcohol depresses that excitatory neurotransmitter. GABA, uh, that's short for gamma amino butyric acid, is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. And alcohol potentiates its effect. So it makes the inhibitory neurotransmitter more inhibitory, and it makes the excitatory one less excitatory. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's involved in reward. I'll show you the reward circuit here in a minute. Uh, that's what gives you that feel-good feeling better than Alka-Seltzer gives. Um, when you feel good about something, if you win the lottery or uh, the uh, high that you get from cocaine or alcohol, that's all caused by dopamine. And then there are the various opioids. These are uh, morphine or heroin type compounds that your brain naturally makes. Your brain makes its own opiates. And alcohol has effects on them as well. This shows a receptor for glutamate, the excitatory neurotransmitter. Here's an ion channel, 
and uh, I don't want to get too complicated here. <laughs> Sorry about that. But alcohol makes that one not work so well. <laughs> Here's uh, a main receptor for GABA, and alcohol makes that one work more. Now you will see in this diagram that we aren't exactly sure where al alcohol works on this receptor. Probably there. This is also where barbiturates work. Uh, things like pentobarbital. Uh, Marilyn Monroe died for an overdose of barbiturates. This is also where benzodiazepines work. Things like Xanax, Valium, and Librium. It's this receptor that explains why you should not take alcohol in combination with Valium or Librium or Xanax or Pentobarbital. They'll have a combined effect that will be greater than the sum of the parts. So if you take a Valium and alcohol, it's not like 1 plus 1 equals 2. It's more like 1 plus 1 equals 20. So don't do it. This is the reward circuit. Now, this is a rat brain. And this is uh, an area in the brain stem that has cell bodies that send dopamine up here to the nucleus accumbens. And when the nucleus accumbens gets that dopamine, that's when you feel real good. When you win the lottery, or you take cocaine, or alcohol. Even marijuana is addictive. And that's because of the release of dopamine here in the nucleus accumbens. And alcohol increases that release. And since your brain manufactures internal opiates, there are a number of opiate receptors, uh, mu kappa and uh, delta. Uh, I won't talk about that, but the point is, your brain makes these natural uh, morphine tape compounds, and alcohol interacts with them all. Now, there is a tolerance to alcohol. We already mentioned uh, the acute tolerance. There's also a cross tolerance with other drugs, like the barbiturates and benzodiazepines. So if uh, it takes more alcohol to make you drunk. It'll also take more Valium to affect you. There's also a cross-dependence, and that's used in the treatment of alcoholism. So, for example, if an alcoholic is taken to the hospital, you have to keep them from going into seizures, and you can do that with Valium or Librium that will prevent withdrawal symptoms in an alcoholic because of this cross-dependence. I already mentioned this acute tolerance. But the person's perception of that also changes. That is, they feel less intoxicated on the declining limb of the alcohol concentration curve. So that they can think, oh, I'm not drunk anymore. I can drive just fine. Well, not really. You also get metabolic tolerance. That is, alcohol alters the enzymes that metabolize it in the liver. And pharmacodynamic tolerance occurs in the brain. When the neurons in the brain adapt to the presence of alcohol, that's when you have addiction. And there's behavioral tolerance. So I already talked about those. If you go into alcohol withdrawal, there are four stages. Uh, there's first what's called autonomic hyperactivity. Uh, your autonomic nervous system controls um, your smooth muscles and glands, like blood pressure and heart rate and so on. Uh, 
Uh, that's followed by hallucinations, and then seizures, and finally delirium tremens. And again, if you're taken to a hospital, you'll typically be given Librium to prevent these withdrawal symptoms. In terms of treatment of alcoholism, there are two pharmacological approaches. One is to give something to make drinking unpleasant, and the other is to try to reduce alcohol's reinforcing properties. So to try to make alcohol drinking unpleasant, you give disulfiram that inhibits aldehyde acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. So you have a buildup of acetaldehyde, which is very unpleasant. And alcoholics typically don't want to take desulfiram <laughs> because they get very nauseous, and throw up, and they don't want to do that. Now, Trexone is a drug that's used to counteract um, opiate addiction, but it also relieves the craving for alcohol. This shows the effects in terms of the percentage of people that don't relapse. And with a placebo, you get the blue curve. With a naltrexone, you get the red curve. So it does help keep, help keep people from drinking. I'll try to wrap this up quickly here in case we have any questions. This is an interesting study done in 1983 by Valiant. It actually was published in 1983. It was what's called a prospective study of alcoholism. There are two types of studies. One is retrospective. That's where you take people, let's say, that are alcoholics now, you try to figure out why they became alcoholics. A prospective study takes a person, and then follows them in the future. In this case, they followed 600 people for 40 years. And the results were the opposite of what you might think. The study showed that personality problems like depression were the result of alcoholism, not the cause. That is, people didn't start drinking because they were depressed. Rather, the alcoholism made them depressed. What about alcoholic energy drinks? Something your brother or sister might drink, for example. Well, at Central Washington University in October 2010, a number of students passed out from drinking four loco. Okay, that's one of these alcoholic energy drinks. What's it have in it? Caffeine, taurine, guarana, and alcohol. Guarana is a South American berry containing caffeine. It's included to mask the amount of caffeine that's in there. So basically, the caffeine cancels or partially cancels the feeling of being drunk, but it doesn't in any way counteract the effects of the alcohol. So you may feel like you're fine, but you're still incapacitated. A survey was done in the United Kingdom in 2010 in which 20 drug experts were asked to fill out a questionnaire dealing with a bunch of different drugs, including heroin, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, and rate them in terms of how harmful they were to the individual and society. They concluded overall that alcohol was overall the most damaging drug. Finally, brand new study just published a couple of months ago by Stockwell and colleagues in 2016. You might have heard that a low level of alcohol, say uh, one drink a day, is good for you. You're better off than being an abstainer. 
This new study by Stockwell says that's a lot of nonsense. That the past studies were flawed. The reason being the control group or the so-called abstainers in past studies included not only people that never drank, but former alcoholics and former social drinkers that were added to the control group. And these former alcoholics and former social drinkers were predisposed towards ill health. So uh, past studies showing a J-shaped function, you know, where the top of the J here represents the abstainers, then the low level of alcohol consumption and high. This point up here is wrong because it includes former alcoholics. If you take them away, then the abstainers are better off health-wise than the low level of alcohol consumers. So, sorry to burst your bubble, but a low level of alcohol is not as good for you as was once thought. And on that note, I will thank you all, and I will entertain any questions you might have. I think they have a ma microphone, ma'am. Well, that's a good question. Actually, I gave a talk at Lawrence in February on medical marijuana. And um, it's not an easy question to answer. Uh, first of all, marijuana is addictive. Now, not as addictive as other drugs, like cocaine or heroin, but it is addictive. And secondly, it's a complicated uh, plant. There are over 400 different chemicals in marijuana. Uh, the two main ones are THC, that stands for delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. That's the component that get, gets you high. And then there's CBD, that's short for cannabidiol. And that's a component that might have some beneficial effects, in particular in treating epilepsy. So also in places like uh, uh, Colorado, uh, the marijuana that's being cultivated has a much higher THC content now than it did, say, in the 1960s or 70s. Back then, the THC content was around 2 to 3 percent. Now it's being cultivated as about 20 percent. So it's much more potent and therefore much more likely to be addictive. Also, there is a dose-related effect of marijuana in producing schizophrenia. And it's especially true the person starts smoking as a teenager. So there are really no good studies on um, medical benefits of marijuana. So it's hard to say exactly what good medically it might do, except possibly the CBD and treating epilepsy. Um, there's obviously problems with uh, purchasing it illegally, and, but uh, I don't see the point in having more drugs readily available. Yes?
Well, it, it's it, it's not that you can't um, recognize THC, but marijuana has got about 400 different chemicals in it, and you'd just be measuring one of them. You've got delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, but you've also got various cannabinols and cannabidiols. And you can't adequately assess how, uh, shall we say, stoned someone is just by looking at THC. That's uh, not quite sure how you would do that. Are there any other questions? I think. Oh. You mentioned something about uh, the effect of alcohol if it's taken rapidly, quickly. Yes. That the effect would be later. You could suggest more alcohol before. Would that be what we're seeing in binge drinking? Well, binge drink. Well, in part, binge drinking is defined as drinking five or more drinks within two hours if you're a man, or four or more drinks in two hours if you're a woman. And there is a rise now in binge drinking, even among pregnant women. And you've probably heard of fetal alcohol syndrome. Okay. Uh, from uh, about 1992, to the present, there's been an increase in the number of pregnant women that have been drinking. And of course, the more you drink, the more likely you are to have a child with fetal alcohol syndrome. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. When you hear people, experts, talking about alcohol, saying they're not prescription, they usually make a division between alcohol and wine. You haven't made that division. I don't know if there's significant division. Well, Alcohol is alcohol, in beer, wine, vodka, whatever. And the only difference, the only real main difference between, say, a red wine, a white wine, vodka, rum, whatever, uh, is the likelihood of having a hangover. The more alcohol you drink, the more impaired you will be. It's all the same. I would say that's poppycock. <laughs> yeah, really, uh, it seems that uh, any level of alcohol is not good for you, but the more you drink, the worse it is for you. There's a, yes, sir. Uh, senile dementia, no, is not the same as alcohol-induced um, changes in memory. In fact, um, this is off topic here, off the topic of alcohol, but uh, there are other drugs that can increase the likelihood of senile dementia far more than alcohol. There was a study done 
about two years ago, uh, published in the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association, that showed that drugs that have, I don't want to get too complicated here, have strong anticholinergic side effects if taken by people over the age of 65 are likely to increase the risk of dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. Now, what in the world do I mean by anticholinergic side effects? I'm glad you asked that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, acetylcholine is another neurotransmitter in the brain. I talked about GABA already and glutamate and so on. Acetylcholine is another one. There are a lot of drugs that have so-called anticholinergic side effects. That is, they block some of the actions of acetylcholine. And there's a medical school saying that sort of uh, deals with these, goes something like dry as a bone, red as a beet, mad as a hatter, I forget the rest of it. <laughs> um, but um, because these drugs have not as their main effect, but as a side effect. All drugs have main effects, that's why you take the drug, but they have side effects, things you don't want but just sort of come along for the ride. And this study looked at three classes of drugs that have strong anticholinergic side effects. Uh, tricyclic antidepressants, which were some of the first antidepressants developed, bladder antimuscarinics and antihistamines. Now, these three classes, if taken by people over the age of 65, increase the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia. Now, there are a lot of other drugs that have anticholinergic side effects. You wouldn't know unless you checked or talked to your doctor or pharmacist or whatever. And it was sort of the cumulative effect of taking these drugs that promoted the development of dementia. So if, say, your parents are taking these drugs, you might want to talk to a physician about getting a different one that has a lower level of anticholinergic side effects. I think we've got time for one more. One more question. In uh, one of your slides, uh, you didn't get there, but at the bottom was the hereditary influences of alcoholism. Could you make a quick comment? On yes, there, there are strong hereditary components to alcoholism. Uh, if uh, your parents were alcoholics, you are more likely to be also. Um, there are a number of studies that have been done, I think mainly in Denmark, where they have a very good uh, record of uh, heredity there, and they, they have a lot of data, and they've followed a lot of this in terms of looking at siblings and half-siblings, and which are most likely to develop alcoholism.